John the Baptist, Joseph Smith, the idea of robbing God, becoming sanctified, and the cleansing of the earth at the time of the second coming. What do all of these have in common? They're all talked about in Malachi chapter 3. Hi, this is Ben, and thanks for listening to the Hope in Christ podcast. Here we are at the end of the Old Testament. Today's scripture highlight comes from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapters 3 and 4 are not only significant because they're the last two chapters of the Old Testament, but these are chapters that were quoted by Jesus Christ when he came to minister to the Nephites in the American continent. The Nephites didn't have the teachings of Malachi. They weren't included on the brass plates because the brass plates were brought from Jerusalem almost 200 years before the time of Malachi. So the Savior shared these teachings with the Nephites, and they're found today in the Book of Mormon in chapters 24 and 25 of 3 Nephi. Chapter 3 begins with a prophecy for the meridian of time when John the Baptist would come to prepare the way for Jesus Christ to perform his mortal ministry in the ancient world. It's also a prophecy about the leaders of Jesus Christ's church in the dispensation of the fullness of times, including a prophecy about Joseph Smith and other leaders who would come before the second coming of Jesus Christ to help prepare the way for Christ return to the earth in power and glory. There's great power in the words of the scriptures here, so I'd like to share the verses with you. In chapter 3, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Let's stop right there after verse 2 and just talk about that for a minute. Jesus Christ is a refiner of fire and like fuller's soap. Now, how is he like fire? A refiner uses fire to heat a metal like silver or gold until it reaches a liquid state. The heating process allows the dross or impurities in the metal to rise to the surface of the liquid where the refiner can remove them, thus purging the metal of all of its impurities. A fuller is someone who cleans or whitens fabrics using soap. So, in what ways is Jesus Christ like a refiner's fire or like fuller's soap to our souls? Elder Bednar said, The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier who cleanses and burns dross and evil out of human souls as though by fire. That's from his talk in April 2016 General Conference. Elder Bruce R. McConkie also said in his book, The Millennial Messiah, The fierce flames, the fervent heat, the burning fires of the second coming that destroy the wicked shall also cleanse the righteous. Evil and sin and dross will be burned out of their souls because they qualify to abide the day. Now, of course, in the meridian of time, John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Christ to come and fulfill his ministry and his atoning mission. In our day, Joseph Smith and many others have been sent to prepare the earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ, to help provide us priesthood power, priesthood authority, and ordinances that take place in holy temples around the earth where we can be cleansed and sanctified and prepared for the day that the Lord comes, so that we're not destroyed, but so that we can abide that day. Going back to Malachi 3, it says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, the sons of Levi were the temple workers of the day, so this has direct connections to God's temple. Now, there are more elements to that prophecy of the sons of Levi offering up an offering in righteousness to the Lord in the last days, but I want to draw out one of them, and it's in Doctrine and Covenants section 128, verse 24. It says, Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand, and who can abide the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, 
that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Let us therefore as a church and a people, and as Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And let us present in His holy temple, when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. There's a direct connection between this offering that is offered up in the temple and the refining of our souls. President Russell M. Nelson said in April 2010, While temple and family history work has the power to bless those beyond the veil, it has an equal power to bless the living. It has a refining influence on those who are engaged in it. They are literally helping to exalt their families. Now, God starts out this chapter by telling us a little bit about what it's like when Jesus comes again. The wicked will be gone, the righteous will be sanctified. Well, what about those who were righteous, who have since turned away? What if they want to come back? True to his character as a loving Heavenly Father, the Lord gives a message of hope in Malachi chapter 3. In verse 7, he said, Return unto me, and I will return unto you. And then he answers the question, how do we return? And he answers that question with another question. Now we begin a conversation that is one of the most powerful discourses on tithing that is found in any of the scriptures. He asks the question, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, where have we robbed thee? And his answer, in your tithes and offerings. And then he says, because of their robbing God through not paying their tithes and offerings, they're cursed with a curse, even the whole nation, for they've robbed him. And then he encourages them to pay their tithing. And if they do, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that they don't even have room to receive it. Speaking of the destruction of the last days, he also includes a promise here that if they pay their tithes and offerings, God will rebuke the devourer. He'll protect us from the destroyer. And he'll do this if we but turn to him by paying our tithes and our offerings. Now, when God promises to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings, those blessings can come in so many forms. Even adversity is a blessing from God. It refines us and perfects us. Blessings can come monetarily, temporally, spiritually. They can come in emotional resilience. They can come in confidence, and most importantly, they come in sanctification, in preparing us to return to His presence and helping us become like He is. In order to enter the temple where we can become sanctified through Christ's power, we have to first commit to obey the law of tithing. Tithing is a preparatory law in that it helps us prepare ourselves to covenant before the Lord to obey the law of sacrifice and also the law of consecration. No one who is short of paying a full tithe is ready to commit to God by covenant to obey the law of consecration. The covenant of consecration and the covenant of sacrifice are covenants that if we live them, it raises us to a higher plane of spiritual living. And that committed way of life, binding ourselves to the Savior through those covenants, allows the Holy Ghost to more fully sanctify and cleanse our souls, to change us, to help us truly become like our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Paying a full tithe, not a partial tithe, but a full tithe, will prepare us to make those covenants of complete sacrifice and consecration to God, allowing Him to change our nature, to change who we are, and to help us become like Him. Allow me to share a couple of quotes with you from some of our modern prophets about tithing and about these verses in Malachi chapter 3. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland once said, Pay your tithes and offerings out of honesty and integrity because they are God's rightful due. Surely one of the most piercing lines in all of Scripture is Jehovah's thundering inquiry, Will a man rob God? And we ask, Wherein have we robbed thee? He answers in tithes and offerings. Paying tithing is not a token gift we are somehow charitably bestowing upon God. Paying tithing is discharging a debt. Elder James E. Talmadge once described this as a contract between us and the Lord. He imagined the Lord saying, 
you have need of many things in this world, food, clothing, and shelter for your family, the common comforts of life. You shall have the means of acquiring these things, but remember they are mine, and I require of you the payment of a rental upon that which I give unto your hands. However, your life will not be one of uniform increase, so instead of doing as mortal landlords do, requiring you to pay in advance, whatever your fortunes or prospects may be, you shall pay me only what when you have received, and you shall pay me in accordance with what you receive. If it so be that in one year your income is abundant, then your ten percent will be a little more. And if it so be that the next year is one of distress and your income is not what it was, then your ten percent will be less. Whatever your circumstance, the tithe will be fair. Have you ever found a landlord on earth who was willing to make that kind of equitable contract with you? When I consider the liberality of it all, he said, I feel in my heart that I could scarcely raise my countenance to heaven if I tried to defraud God out of that which is rightfully his. Elder Holland continued, This leads to a fifth reason to pay our tithes and offerings. We should pay them as a personal expression of love to a generous and merciful Father in heaven. In April 1994, President Dallin H. Oaks said, I believe these are promises to the nations in which we reside. When the people of God withheld their tithes and offerings, Malachi condemned this whole nation. Similarly, I believe that when many citizens of a nation are faithful in the payment of tithes, they summon the blessings of heaven upon their entire nation. The Bible teaches that righteousness exalteth a nation, and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The payment of tithing also brings the individual tithe payer unique spiritual blessings. Tithe paying is evidence that we accept the law of sacrifice. It also prepares us for the law of consecration and the other higher laws of the celestial kingdom. The lectures on faith prepared by the early leaders of the restored church part the curtain on that subject when they say, Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For, from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation could never be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. In 2013, Elder David A. Bednar said, The imagery of the windows of heaven used by Malachi is most instructive. Windows allow natural light to enter into a building. In like manner, spiritual illumination and perspective are poured out through the windows of heaven and into our lives as we honor the law of tithing. In 2011, President Russell M. Nelson said, Not only that, tithing will keep your name enrolled among the people of God and protect you in the day of vengeance and burning. And in 2005, President Nelson said, Now is the time to enroll our names among the people of God. This we do by paying tithing. He tithes his people to bless them. In 2001, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, I can't list all the ways that blessings will come from obedience to this principle, but I testify many will come in spiritual ways that go well beyond economics. In my life, for example, I have seen God's promise fulfilled that he would rebuke the devourer for my sake. That blessing of protection against evil has been poured out upon me and my loved ones beyond any capacity I have to adequately acknowledge. But I believe that divine safety has come, at least in part, because of our determination, individually and as a family, to pay tithing. And Elder D. Todd Christofferson said, just in 2019, We live in a hedonistic age when many question the importance of the Lord's commandments or simply ignore them. Not infrequently, people who flout divine directives such as the law of chastity, the standard of honesty, and the holiness of the Sabbath seem to prosper and enjoy the good things of life, at times even more so than those who are striving to be obedient. Some begin to wonder if the efforts and sacrifices are worth it. The ancient people of Israel once complained, It is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept His ordinance, and that we've walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Just wait, said the Lord, until that day when I make up my jewels. Then shall ye discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The wicked may have joy in their works for a season, 
but it is always temporary. The Savior declared that if a church or a life be not built upon my gospel and is built upon the works of men or upon the works of the devil, verily I say unto you, they have their joy in their works for a season, but by and by the end cometh, and they are hewn down and cast into the fire from whence there is no return. The joy of the saints is enduring. Close quote. Our God is a God of promised blessings. With God, there's something called impossible mathematics. It seems that 90% with the Lord's blessings is greater than 100% without the Lord's blessings. Many Christian religions like to believe that tithing by obligation was associated only with the law of Moses and with the covenant of ancient Israel. But that's flawed thinking, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob tithed long before the law of Moses was given, and we know that in the latter days the law of tithing has been restored. And it is a law that, if it is lived faithfully and fully, prepares us and assists us in making and keeping covenants such as the covenant of sacrifice, the covenant of obedience, and the covenant of consecration, allowing us greater access to the power of God in our lives. My friends, I hope this has been helpful to you. I really love the verse at the end of this chapter where the Lord talks about making up His jewels. That's a reference to you and I. It's a reference to His holy ones or His saints, whom He will welcome back home to Him when He comes again. I hope you look forward to our final scripture highlight from the book of Malachi, where we'll talk more about the second coming and how the Lord is preparing us for it. Have an excellent day and keep your hope in Christ.